The challenge comes though, when we didn't educate our children and we try to paint it that collision is just a problem, collision is not the problem. Collision is not a problem. Marriage is marriage. That's like saying marriage is a problem. You as a man, that drive that you have, put it like this. Um, if you don't have that drive, you don't have that testosterone, then you become soft, you become weak. One of the attributes of man is you should be strong. I don't care what age you are. You should be strong or working on your strength. All right, if not just physically, minimally, mentally, but being strong is the attribute of a man. But you don't have no components, you're not strong, you're weak. We see it with animals. Get them spaded, neuter, neuter. This is what they do to the, the male dogs, right? So again, um, important because that drive, women tend to look at it just a sexual drive because they tend to be the recipients of that. It's sad, but ask women in your life, you know, uh, ask women, literally ask them, or you can ask online or ask anonymous. They ask women, ask other women, these different conversations. We also have a form of privilege. This privilege is, uh, this male privilege. Women have to think about so many different things just going out in public, depending on where you are in the world. They have to wonder or not wonder whether or not somebody's going to try to talk to them or become too aggressive, scoop them up, take advantage of them, rape them. I didn't, I've, ne <laughs> I've never had that. And you know what I'm saying? That's sick as hell. Never had that, never had felt if I was going to be raped by a woman. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's never crossed my mind. But many women have to deal with that. And furthermore, Compound that with some of the trauma that has occurred by loved ones and people that they know, people that are close to the family, um, while they were coming up. I'm telling you, check the stats on that. That's real. So, you know, and it's not any necessarily uh, any fault of their own. So let's continue. Your reasons for poly. One, you don't need reasons. You don't. Trying to justify reasons is not going to get it because then it gets relegated to a, oh, now you, oh, now you want to be Captain Sabo. Well, if you know who that is from, if you listen to 90s hip hop, you know the song. Because now, oh, you, now you got to deal with it. And I'm saying that very particularly because many women who decide to practice polygyny or come in as an additional uh, or second or third wife or whatnot, that's what they get called. They get called hoes, home records, snakes, all kinds of uh, demeaning, despicable names. All right, that's uncalled for. But then the man is like, oh, well, you know, she's a single mom or she's a divorcee or she's a widow, which are all noble. All of them are noble and they're fine. But she could also have never been married before. Okay? It does not take away um, from the value of a woman for her circumstances like that. Should a man choose to marry her? I mean, I married Coach Nyla. She had, she was a single mother. She had gotten married, um, got divorced, had another child. So then she was a single mother again, divorced. Hey, didn't take away from her value. And if you know my wife, my wife is super dope. Super dope. So you would have to wonder, all right, the type of man that I have to be to marry these types of women all right, and move in a direction. And that's what we're dealing with in this class. That's what we can deal with in all four sessions. One, you don't need a reason. If you want to provide a reason, a brother told me this. And as I look back on it, it was one of the best reasons ever. He said, listen, I said, baby, he said, tell you why. He said, you know, baby, being married to you is one of the best experiences of my life, if that's true. So being married to you, one of the best experiences of my life. And I want to do that again. <laughs> I want to do it again. It's so good. I want to do it again. Now that yeah, you might need some arms length from said that because it's a little, you know, it's a little tongue in cheek. And I, I never said that, by the way. I didn't tell Coach Benson that. So, <laughs> you know, I just remember the advice because it's, it's real. It's good advice. And some people say, well, why do you need a, an additional wife? Fact is, you don't. You don't need an additional wife. If you already have a wife, you don't need an additional one. You don't. All right, that wife can fulfill all of your desires and things, and she'll be able to fulfill all your desires that you have. Should be the key word. But I'm going to let you know, I don't like the word should because we use it too much. We should all over ourselves. 
I should do this. I should do that. It's a new year. I should get in shape. I should make more money. I should have did this. I should have, should have, should have, should have, should have. Or the coulda, shoulda, woulda stuff, right? All right. She should. She should. I was talking with a brother uh, when I was training. And he said, um, the country is a Muslim country. And he said, you know what? They don't practice polygyny. They outlaw poly uh, polygyny, right? And he said he was talking to one of the, the chefs, one of the scholars here. And he said, you know, it's a shame that they did. He said, the Sheikh is well off making seven figures and has a number of different investments in land. All that. And he said, you know, one of the challenges is that because we can't have polygyny, our wives aren't any good. They become feminists and deal with all this kind of stuff. And then they don't want to do certain things. And now all of a sudden, you know, we can't marry anybody else. So there's no competition. So it came to the point where his, his final thing was that they don't have to compete with anybody else because they figured I have my man. He can't have, have anybody else. That's it. They don't have to work out anymore. They don't have to um, look good anymore because they got their man, was his, his complaint. And it was, I can see what he was saying. And, you know, that can be true in many cases. But back to the point. You don't need a reason, bro. She don't need to compete with somebody else. And using a threat is something that's really immature. Like, you don't do this, I'm going to get another wife. Don't be that dude. That's, that's really, um, <laughs> that's a punk. So let me, um, I need to stay on track because I know that there are points that we need to hit. Then I'm also going to open it up uh, for questions mm -hmm. shortly. And then we'll have our continued session in our private members area. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to impact on children, think about this. When I was younger, I don't know your background necessarily where you're from. But when I was younger, I used to believe in Santa Claus. Any of y'all believe in Santa Claus? As we said, and didn't even know that the word Santa also, when you change the letter around, it comes to Satan. Anybody believe in Santa Claus? What about Tooth Fairy? Easter Bunny? <laughs> Any of these things? Or you always Muslim, you was always on the hop. <laughs> well, I just believe in that stuff. And why do I make that point right now? Is because parents. The first time I was ever betrayed, and I'm telling you, I didn't understand what that feeling was until I got the word over a decade later, maybe close to early teenage years. I said, wow, you know, the first person I remember betraying me was my parents. I was five years old, living in the hood, had no chimney, <laughs> which is important because it defies logic because you're trusting someone. And as a child, you have this ultimate trust traditionally in your parents. You should be able to trust them. So my father woke me up one night. We had our Christmas tree and stuff, had gifts and everything over there. All I wanted was a bike. So he woke me up one night, five. Like I remember this vividly. Picked me up off the couch. For some reason, I'm on the couch instead of in my room. Picked me up, shook me. He was like, Mike, Mike. Because that was my name back then, right? It was Mike. I said, call you Mike, Mike. He grabbed me and he was like, Santa Claus just left. And he opens the front door. We were in a duplex on the second floor of the duplex, opens the front door. There's snow all on the porch and everything else. And he takes me out there. I'm like just waking up, discombobulated, right? And he's pointing all up in the sky. And I'm looking all up in the sky with him and start telling me Santa Claus just left. And I come back in the house <laughs> and I see this bike. It was a bike like half put together and stuff like that. And everything else is like, you know, he, he, what is, well, how old was he? He's 21 years old. All right, 21, because I'm five. Um, <laughs> and so he goes through this whole thing, right? And then I come to find out, Santa Claus saying, really? Like, dude, you lied to me. You put this whole thing on and lied to me. He, he, we laughed about it years later. But my parents betrayed me. What does this have to do with polygyny? What it has to do with polygyny is that your children will believe, they'll believe what you teach them. So whether or not you're planning on practicing polygyny, they should know that this ancient form of marriage existed. We want to teach them about the wealthiest person that ever lived, Mansa Musa, Muslim, Mansa Musa, coming from Senegal, Gambia and Western Mali, and created inflation all through Rome and the whole Mediterranean trip as he went on his way to make Hajj, going to Mecca. We are teaching about that, but we're not teaching about how many wives he had. Like, come on, what? We're not teaching about his legacy. Or his brother, Abu Bakr, um, Abu Bakr Mansa Abu Bakr who came over to the United States and he advocated his throne. Well, came over to the Americas, the United States, but um, came over, you know, hundreds of years before Columbus. 
We want to teach them that, but we forget to teach them about polygyny. That doesn't make sense. See, if you teach your children about these different options and what life is, they can appreciate that and make their own decisions. So the impact on the children is basically depending on how the parents are leading with the way they want the children to see things. How will they know that monogamy is the way other than the Disney knight in shining armor, helpless women, guy come to save them type complex? Why? Because they see TV, TV commercials now with men kissing each other, women kissing each other, and you know they're getting cards for you know their, their marriage and wedding, and that's supposed to be okay because that's what TV teaches them? No, we teach them. We help um, indoctrinate, if you will, right? And let them make their own decisions. So whether it's talking about polygyny, that talk needs to be had and should be had. Why? Because we want our children to be educated and well-cultured. And if you think that monogamy is the only way, there's something wrong. Something's really wrong. And we are a victim of that same societal conditioning that has been put that Nancy Cobb talks about in her book. All right, so the impact of the children is relatively simple. Now, there's some basics that go along with those. So, so when we talk about the dozens of mama jokes, it's a problem because I ain't talking about mama. Right? Now, a child obviously is going to have more affinity towards their mother. This is their mom. Mom is a superstar. Dad may be a star, but mom is a superstar. Unless, again, there's some type of challenges or abuse and stuff like that that went on. As that superstar, there are different things that are expected. So if mom is hurt, she doesn't like something, then the children may take it as, oh, dad hurt mom. They're going to be siding moms. The challenge comes, though, when we didn't educate our children and we try to paint it that collision is just a problem, collision is not the problem. Collision is not a problem. Marriage is marriage. That's like saying marriage is a problem. Right? So educate your family, educate your children about what collision is. You may not like it, you may not want your husband to practice it. All right. But that doesn't take the fact away that it is existing, it exists for quite some time. And it doesn't matter because it's pretty much in every scripture. It doesn't matter what scripture you follow. You can go to it and find it. I mean, you talk about prophet uh, Ishaq or Jacob and his four wives. And you have the story of many Israel, children of Israel. You know, and they, they were jealous of saying that his father loved Yusuf's mother, Joseph's mother, and Benjamin's mother more than theirs. So that jealousy and stuff kept in. You got prophet Ibrahim. And his first son, Ismail, born from his wife, Hagar, or Hagar. And then Sarah, I mean, two of these blessed bloodlines. You have Musa and his wives from Midian. I mean, so we have Moses and his wives. So we have so many examples. I mean, we're not even going to talk about the 700 wives of Prophet Solomon there. So they met. He's a king. All right, and 300 concubines. So again, this is, that's just part of some of the examples, some of the history. But if we teach them the history, they can make their own decisions. Sloan Lake of Peace. I'm Coach Navir, one of the co-founders of Outstanding Personal Relationships, as well as a co-author of Let's Talk Polygyny Uncensored, where my wives, Coach Fatima and Coach Nyla and I teach people really how to live life at a higher level and have your best relationships, especially when practicing polygyny. So with that being said, I want to invite you to a polygyny masterclass that I'm conducting in four parts. So over the next several Sundays, for 60 to probably 90 minutes or so, depending on the, the amount of questions that we get, is we're going to be talking about what does it take for you as a man to practice polygyny in a healthy way? What are the strategies, the tactics? Who do you have to become in order to do it right, as they say? So beginning on Sunday, January 16th, we're starting what I kind of call the idea stage or the inspect what you expect. That's just taking stock of yourself. Are you qualified? What are some of the reasons behind it? What do you need to learn? What parts do you need to equip yourself with for this new journey that you're about to partake in, should you choose? So we have to inspect ourselves as men, all right? And I don't know if you've been through some of my other trainings, whether dealing with boyhood or being managed to a man or a man of value to being a king, but we have to see where you are and we have to evaluate ourselves and give ourselves a grade, if you will, kind of like a report card. So that's January 16th. The next week is what I call the pre-stage. The pre is when you have to have those hard discussions, not only with yourself, but with your wife. Or if you're single, you know, and you're looking to practice polygyny, then whoever you become in a relationship, whoever you're in a relationship with, 
All right, and there are many different types of ways to go about it, but we're gonna, hey, we're gonna discuss that. We have to get into it and how to do it effectively and how to also listen effectively. And on building on the first week, you have to determine whether or not you're able to handle and cope with the societal pressures, the changing conditioning, the conditioning that has been beaten all of us that this is the only way and this is how this looks. All right, this is a totally different thing. And being prepared in polygyny, a lot of it, a lot of the emotions, a lot of other things that you're going to deal with and come across, you're going to learn on your feet because you didn't have to deal with that monogamy or if you're just in a relationship with one person. So that's January 23rd. January 30th, we're going to be discussing and going into detail with transitioning. So if you're making that move from monogamy to polygyny, again, there are dynamics that you have not experienced. There are emotions and things that you may not have known you've had and how to deal with, let alone children, wives. All right. So we're going to be dealing with that transitioning period, what it looks like when it, when it comes to scheduling, scheduling or finances and so on. Very, very important. And then we go to February 6th, where that's after it's happened. You know, what is the new normal? How long does it normally take? How can we accelerate it? Or how can we accelerate some of the healing if there was any trauma or any challenges that go on there? You know, is it best to um, notify prior to or after? What is it? All right. So we get into what's the new normal look like. And I know I know I'm speaking from a position of privilege right now, but I wish I had this almost 12 years ago when I decided to go on a journey and practice policing myself. So you may look at now and see us with, uh, if you've seen outstanding personal relationships with what we do is see my wife's coaching and empowering people and, and whatnot. Don't compare your chapter one, two, or three to our chapter 10, 11, and 12. <laughs> we got to put in the work because the only place that success comes before work is in the dictionary. So I want to invite you to go ahead and take advantage of it. Matter of fact, the first one on January 16th is free. Feel free to come and ask any questions or whatnot. But after that, we want to separate those who are curious from those who are serious. So if you want to go ahead and purchase access where you get the downloadable worksheets, you get the audios, you get access to me directly and whatnot, and you get our private membership area, then go ahead and purchase it. Then it's for you. All right. I wish I had something that really broke down the steps in a practical fashion. Now, it doesn't matter what background you come from, whether it's your ethnicity or your faith background or what scriptures you may follow. This is something that uh, predates Islam. Of course, I'm a Muslim, a practicing Muslim. I practice Islam and polygyny based upon Islam. It's fine. But we're going to talk about universal principles and practicing this ancient form of marriage because there's wisdom that many people are missing out on simply because it's not an option today. It's simply because it's not an option. We want to untaboo that. And should you be a man that's deciding to step up your leadership and be the man that you have to be in order to practice polygyny in a healthy fashion, I look forward to seeing you in our polygyny masterclass. Make sure you go ahead and sign up, get registered. I'll keep you posted and I look forward to seeing you there. Slow alaikum. Peace. But not teaching them, that's not right. Not teaching them is not right. Setting them up to go ahead and feel that they're being betrayed, mm -mm, that's not right. You want a man shame or a man shame a person to feel that you should be shamed and you need to make excuses as a man? You really don't have to. But we do have to inspect ourselves to see if we qualify or what it is that we need to do to qualify. Because the first thing, the first thing here is this: there are different characteristics that really make up a man. And one of those characteristics, of course, is bravery and courage. So there's something that you have to do. That's um, having a hard conversation. The first hard conversation you have is with yourself and say, "Do I measure up as a man? Am I independent, taking care of myself? Am I taking care of my wife? Am I taking care of my family? I may, am I homeless? You know what I'm saying? We live in a height, we comfortable. You know, we secure." You know, we lay back, we got luxuries. Where am I? Where am I at financially? Where am I on scale? All right. And the fact is, one percent. If you look at a one percent, they're only making. I mean, they're making a quarter, little over a quarter million dollars a year. You want to be in one percent? Quarter mil. All right. Quarter mil actively coming in every single year, normally passive income wise. But giving yourself a grade. What does your finance say about the grade? Are you a C? Your D? Your B? A? What is it? What do you need to get to? How do your finances look? Do you need to relocate to a different part of the country or a different part of the world where you might be making 50000 that 50000 is nothing if you're on the east or west coast or even, you know, Midwest, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? You go down south, it's a little bit better. You go to a whole other country, you ball. You know? So giving yourself a report card. What's your financial report card look like? One of the ways to check that out is looking at your credit score. You know? Do you know anything about it? What is your credit score? What's your FICO score? Do you have any assets? Where's your balance sheet? 
You know, do you know what EBSI is from Kiyosaki? Are you an employee, you're self-employed, a specialist? You're a business owner, meaning you can walk away from the business that keeps going, you're an investor? Where you at on that scale? How are you looking? Because there are two things that comes in polygyny that matter and that can be seen that are easy to calculate. One is finances. Those are simply digits and numbers. Those are easy. So what's your grade on that? If you're thinking about it and you're considering it, what is your grade on that? That's the first thing. That's easily recognizable. The second is time. Again, it can be calculated. We all have 24 hours in that day. We're equal at that point. But what are you looking at? Your money and your time. If you're a truck driver, if you're a firefighter, gone 72 hours per shift, how would that even work into your life? If you look at Again, very, very important. How do you how do you qualify? What is the preparation that you that you need to make? Do you need to make five figures a month? Do you need to lessen your employee income, your self-employed income, and increase your business income? Or your investment income? And again, we're going to talk a little bit more about different resources that, especially in week three when we come to transition. But these are questions we have to ask ourselves. Now we have to also deal with and look at the white women. I get this question, and this this is it's funny, but it's not. Because for some reason, men think that it's like, well, where do I find these women? Oh, man, I have to do something. Like, where do I find you know women that are interested? But look like this is just some type of um, island or something that you could find uh, women that are interested in collision on. It's hilarious to me. But um, let me see. What is this actually? Now the challenge is that there's not like women just waiting and just signed up on you know we willing to be second wives, third wives. Dot com, right? That would be, you know, amazing if that's the case. It's not the case. And one of the reasons is not the case, I spoke about it before, is we talk about predators. Predators exist. There are those who pray for you, and there are those who pray on you. And the difference in that prayer is a letter between A and E. And just because you have um, a religious or spiritual background does, that, does not mean that you or your congregation or people are immune from that. To the contrary, when it comes to religion in particular, you have cults and you have organizations and people that have given it a bad name um, to begin with in the name of God. All right, done it a lot. Again, it doesn't matter your religion. I'm not picking on a, a particular belief system, but it's happening and it's weak as hell. And there are men who allow other men to do that by not checking them. Okay, so relationship spheres. I'm going to break this down, and then we're going to talk about more next week when it comes to um, what to expect. So let me share this with you. You have to understand this, because when you're in the idea stage, it's easy to think, oh, you're going to go ahead and have another wife. So you're married already. You may or may not have children, and you're thinking, okay, it's just going to be three of us, or it might be five of us if I have children, whatever, right? And this is the, the challenge. When you are married, you're already married. So let's say your name is Ali, right? And let's say your wife's name is um, Fatima. How about that? So your name is Ali, your wife's name is Fatima. Ali is the man, Fatima is the woman. Clearly, you don't need to know your pronouns. <laughs> so when they're married, they have, a, they have their own unique identities. Ali, is, Ali has his likes, he has his dislikes, things he um, loves to do, things he loves to eat, places he likes to go, um, things he does for recreation, right? Fatima, same thing. Right, she has her own identity, things she likes, things she don't like, certain like to wear, things that turn her on, things that turn her off. They have their own individual identities. They meet each other. They get married. They still have these identities. Neither of you should just let go of your identities in total. Not going to happen. Instead, what will happen is that third marital identity you see right on the top, that third shared marital identity. That's what you think about marriage, your experiences in marriage, different compromises, different things that you may not necessarily like or enjoy, but you do because your partner does. Whether that's going to watch a chick flick in the movie theater, going to an amusement park, you know, instead of just reading a book, if you're an introvert or what have you, whatever it may be, you know, you have this shared marital identity is that you want each other to be happy. You want, if a smart woman wants her husband to feel admired, adored, appreciated for what he does, and a man wants his woman to feel that she's wanted, she's heard, she wants to feel heard with him, she feels protected, and all of these things, natural stuff. Now, here's the other part. These are normal, natural things. And it goes without saying or should go without saying. That traditionally speaking, when you get married, there's basically a contract on your private parts and that person's private parts. 
right? This belongs there, that belongs here. That's kind of what that is across the board, no matter what type of marriage you jump in a room or whatever culture you come from, right? That's there. So with that being said, there are some things that can be unspoken. However, there are other things that if they are not spoken about can affect and challenges in the thinking, the feelings, the emotions of people, uh, in particular women, for example. So when you talk about, okay, I want to marry somebody else, now through societal conditioning, I should grow up, different things she's experienced and everything throughout life. Now come to the forefront, she may feel like, oh, now you're, now you're betraying her or something is wrong with her. All right, I didn't do something wrong. I didn't do this or, you know, something wrong with me or why are you so lustful and all of these type of things start to go because now you're searching for answers for situations you didn't have because there were not people that were teaching you about polygyny. One. Second, people who were practicing it were not demonstrating it. Number two. All right. And three, there may be unresolved traumas and challenges that person had that is now coming surface. But what happens is not just you find somebody else or somebody else wants to marry you. And now it's just four. It's not because it becomes six. You are your own identity. She has hers. She has her idea of marriage and, and uh, the shared marital identity, which may not be the same as yours in your first marriage. All right. And you may be able to let other parts of your personality out of different things or experiment more that weren't there in your first marriage, which is, again, it's totally fine, but you have a totally separate shared marital identity with two different women. These are six different identities, all right? Very important to understand. There's a whole lot of things to juggle there, right? And we're not built for emotional warfare. We built for on the battlefield warfare. We built for strategy. We built for big picture thinking. So we crumble a lot of times when there's too many words or too many feelings and different things that go on as men. But now we have to up our game our emotional intelligence so that we're adequately able to deal with reassuring here, helping understand as much as possible because a woman will never understand the drive that a man has in himself, period. Traditional men, healthy men have 10 times the level of testosterone as women. So traditional, normal male behaviors are assertiveness, aggression, very important. Now that doesn't mean just unbridled aggression and abuse and all that. No, 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 aggression. Somebody comes to the house, something's going on, you gotta step up, you gotta fight, you gotta stop the threat. All right, we like aggression, we do. All right, it raises your level of testosterone today when you watch football, if you're gonna watch football today, go pack. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that aggression, that's normal. If you have sons, you know what I'm talking about. All right, nevertheless, being that that's a part of us, they're not gonna understand it. Just like we're not gonna understand premenstrual cramps, how that feels, why, we're not going to understand it when it comes to childbirth. Listen, I delivered three of my sons, one with the help of midwife. The last two was just me. Most her just <laughs> grateful that they're born, they're happy, healthy, alive. But one of the most challenging things I've ever done in my life. OK, but I'm telling you, I could have won an Oscar because <laughs> my wife didn't know. I mean, I was daddy doula in delivering this, these babies. Why? Because. You have to have the ability to do hard things as men and be responsible. That means I'm saying <laughs> go birth your own children, all this stuff at home. So it's not a bad idea. Home birthing, water birthing, all that super dope. Far better than the hospital taking somebody who has 10 biological children and three of them one at home. Had I done that to begin with, likely would have never done anything in the hospital. But that's neither here nor there. It's not a topic of discussion. But understanding these different dynamics of relationships, whether or not your wives will have a relationship with each other at least on a cordial, respectful level, none at all, different countries, different states, all of that stuff we're going to be digging into more next week. 